Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, passion for excellence. Dow Automotive Systems, improving durability and increasing design flexibility with Betamate structural adhesives at DowBetamate.com. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. This is AutoLine Daily for May 12, 2011, and now the news. Earlier this week, GM announced it will be hiring 4,200 workers at its plants in the U.S., and now Bloomberg reports Chrysler might add 3,000 jobs. But the news is actually better than that. According to the Center for Automotive Research, each automotive job generates over six other jobs with suppliers and their suppliers, as well as jobs created by the money that those people spend. Using that multiplier effect, the GM and Chrysler jobs will generate another 47,000 jobs and boost the U.S. GDP by several billion dollars. And one of the reasons Chrysler needs to hire more workers is that it is doing a better job of exporting and selling vehicles outside of North America. Chrysler's overseas sales were over 13,000 units last month, which represent about 8% of its total sales. And in yet another indication the American economy is clawing its way back, the big truck segment had its best sales month of the year in April. According to Wards, sales of medium and heavy duty trucks were up over 31% last month. Class four was the only segment to see a decline. Heavy truck sales are a great leading indicator of what the economy is going to do in the next six months. So this is really good news. But this is not. The saga at Saab is going from bad to worse. The Swedish automaker thought it had a deal with Chinese automaker Hatai to pump several hundred million dollars into the company in exchange for stock. But Reuters reports that deal collapsed this morning because neither company could get the approvals to build a car in China. Remember, the Chinese government wants to see fewer car companies in the country, not more. And now Autoblog reports that Victor Muller, the CEO of Saab, is talking about using Saab dealerships in the US and Europe to sell an unnamed Chinese SUV. He's saying it would only retail for about $10,000, but I see no chance of this happening. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it sure looks like Saab has come to the end of the road. Exports of Chinese vehicles were up last month. According to Gascu, Chinese automakers exported 67,500 units in April. That's a 7% increase compared to March and nearly a 70% jump from the first quarter of last year. Cherry is by far the largest vehicle exporter, shipping over 41,000 vehicles, and that is 60% of all Chinese exports. And speaking of car shipments, well, they're not coming from China. Sales of imported cars are up in Japan. According to the Wall Street Journal, with production shortages in the country due to the earthquake, imported vehicle sales shot up 43% last month, while domestic sales fell 43%. But we got to put this in perspective. Import sales were less than 17,000 units, while domestic sales were over 185,000. And in fact, those import figures include cars made by Japanese brands overseas that were shipped back to Japan for sale. If you exclude those vehicles, foreign brands totaled 12,500 units, and that is less than 7% of the total. But even though Japanese automakers are taking it on the chin, and as we reported yesterday, Toyota's net profit dropped nearly 80%, Nissan is in the black. According to Rupert Murdoch, oh, I mean the Wall Street Journal, the automaker just posted a higher than expected profit for its fiscal fourth quarter, bringing in about $380 million. Strong sales in North America, China, and Europe were enough to offset the currency and earthquake problems that are still ravaging the industry. Panic stops. We've all come to a screeching halt at some point in our driving careers, and it's comforting to know that automakers test for these kinds of situations. Well, the same is true of aircraft manufacturers. We found this one on Autoblog. Boeing released a video of a braking test it performed on its new 747-8. The aircraft blitzed down the runway at more than 200 miles an hour. And in what's known as a rejected takeoff, the test pilot slammed on the brakes. 
No reverse thrusters were allowed for this nearly million pound plane. The carbon brakes performed better than the engineers predicted, dragging the behemoth to a halt some 700 feet sooner than expected. The brakes were glowing red hot after the test, hitting an estimated 1400 degrees Celsius. You know, I hope I'm never on a flight where the pilot has to abort a takeoff like this. But still, it's nice to know today's aircraft can handle this kind of panic stop. And you know, that gives me an idea. I think it's time to raise the speed limit, and not by a little bit. That is coming up next. Introducing Bridgestone's third generation of run-flat tires with groundbreaking new Bridgestone technologies. Bridgestone run-flat tires offer improved ride comfort, lower rolling resistance, and improved wear while giving you the peace of mind and comfort you need. Back in the 19th century, Queen Victoria stipulated that when she traveled by train, it could not go over 40 miles an hour. Faster than that was considered harmful to one's health. Today, cars travel a lot faster than that, but you know, we have not made any progress in over half a century. Ever since the mid-1950s, cars have been limited to 70 miles an hour. It takes just as long to travel from point A to point B as when Eisenhower was president. So I think it's time to raise the speed limit. We need to put a comprehensive plan in place to gradually move the limit up over the next few decades to 150 miles an hour. And we need to do that with no sacrifice in fuel economy or safety. People tell me it's impossible or crazy to design passenger cars to go 150. But you wanna know why German luxury cars are so good? Because they are designed to go 150. In fact, most of them have speed limiters on them, otherwise they'd go even faster. We now have adaptive cruise control and radar braking. Soon we'll have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and after that, autonomous vehicles like Google's pushing for. Put it all together and we're literally on the verge of making it almost impossible for cars to crash into one another. And that opens the door to 150 mile an hour speed limit on national highways. A stretch goal like that would unleash a frenzy of R&D activity, create new companies, grow new jobs, and produce an economic boom, much like building the interstate highway system did back in Eisenhower's day. So while we might laugh about Queen Victoria limiting her train to 40 miles an hour, I bet that later in this century, people will be laughing at us for thinking that driving 150 was dangerous. Hey, don't forget to tune in to AutoLine After Hours tonight. Our guest is Marjorie Krevsky, who will be bringing in auto show models who will model vintage outfits from the last 40 years of auto shows. By the way, time's running out to win a copy of Sirens of Chrome. Check out the details of the contest by visiting the John's Journal page of AutolineDetroit.tv. And that is today's report on the top news in the global automotive industry. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.